There is a thread that runs through all life, from sea nets and sea lions to the ferns and mosses of the forest floor. A thread that runs through every human being alive and who has ever lived. A thread that is passed from parents to their children. That thread, the one that gives life its continuity and passes the blueprints of life from one generation to the next, is deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA. The name deoxyribonucleic acid sounds complex and intimidating. Diagrams and illustrations of the molecule, likewise, suggest a molecule whose composition and structure can only be fathomed by PhDs in biochemistry. But, like so much in the physical world, DNA's effectiveness in carrying out its role in nature is due to its simplicity, not to any incredible complexity. The two strands that spiral around one another in a double helix to form the thread of life are made up of only four different subunits called nucleotides. The order of the four bases of these nucleotides, thymine, cytosine, adenine, and guanine on DNA's spiral staircase communicate instructions to a cell or organism in a unique code biologists call the genetic code. Before we look at the structure and chemical behavior of DNA further, let's consider the four functions that it has to perform as the genetic material contained in all life forms on Earth. One of the functions DNA has to perform is replicating itself. There is a lot of replicating and reproduction going on in the living world. Plants and animals creating offspring, their cells dividing, and unicellular protists and bacteria dividing too. Each and every cell in every organism has to have a copy or copies of the DNA unique to its particular species. While it's important for DNA to replicate accurately so that when cells divide, each receives exactly the same genetic information as the other, it is just as important, in terms of creating the Earth's incredible living diversity, that an error or mutation occur occasionally, and that these mutations can be transmitted to future generations, which is just what happens when a mutation occurs in the DNA of a sex cell. The diversity of life here on Earth is largely a result of mutations that have occurred in strands of DNA over the last three billion years. Another requirement of DNA as a genetic material is that it be able to store the information that determines the characteristics of organisms and the cells of which they are made up. On the surface, this sounds like an easy and obvious goal, but there are animals, like certain species of turtles, that can live hundreds of years, and plants like redwoods that can live thousands. That is a long time to store information in a potentially volatile chemical environment. If the cells in an organism started losing parts of their biochemical memories on a mass scale and forgetting which critical cellular functions to carry out, it wouldn't be long until the organism died as a result of this cellular memory loss. Finally, DNA or any other potential genetic material has to be able to use the information it stores to direct the synthesis of the structural proteins and enzymes necessary for the operation of the organism and its cells. Structural proteins define and maintain the shape of a cell or organism, while enzymes are large proteins that are critical to carrying out all the various chemical reactions essential to life. The elegant simplicity of DNA is at the heart of its performance of its varied tasks as the molecule of heredity. Each sequence of bases spells out, in a sort of biological Morse code, a unique set of genetic instructions. In a length of DNA only 10 nucleotide pairs long, the four bases can exist in over a million different combinations. As the average chromosome of higher organisms is billions of nucleotides or base pairs long, we can see that the information storage potential of a strand of DNA is tremendous. But the huge number of base pairs in the DNA of any given chromosome would also appear to make the potential for replication errors tremendously high.
Fortunately, for the cause of accurate DNA replication, the base pairing rule we mentioned earlier has a very important ramification. That the sequence of bases on one strand of the double helix accurately predicts the sequence of bases on the other complementary strand. For example, an adenine base on the first strand means a thymine base opposite on the second complementary strand. Likewise, a cytosine base on the first strand means a guanine base on the second complementary strand. The first step in the replication of DNA is dividing the DNA into two complementary strands. This is accomplished by an enzyme called DNA helicase that walks along one strand, breaking the bonds between the base pairs and nudging the other strand out of the way. Rather than one DNA helicase enzyme unzipping an entire chromosome, hundreds of helicase enzymes unzip different sections of a chromosome. While the helicase enzymes are unzipping sections of DNA, other enzymes called DNA polymerase match the exposed bases with new complementary bases to build a new complementary strand. One DNA polymerase runs down each strand. The two DNA polymerase molecules in each section work in opposite directions, following the orientation of the sugar phosphate backbone of their respective strands. The DNA polymerase working in the same direction as the DNA helicase can simply follow it, forming one complementary base pair after another. The DNA polymerase working in the opposite direction of the DNA helicase have to work somewhat differently. The first DNA polymerase working in the opposite direction of the DNA helicase jumps onto its strand at the last base pair divided by the DNA helicase and starts forming new complementary base pairs while moving in the opposite direction of the DNA helicase. It continues to do so until it reaches the point where the DNA helicase started and broke apart its first base pair. At this point, the first DNA polymerase jumps off. In the meantime, the DNA helicase has gone further down the DNA, breaking base pairs. A second DNA polymerase again jumps on at the last broken base pair and starts forming new complementary pairs until it reaches the point where the first DNA polymerase started. At this point, another enzyme called DNA ligase bonds the backbones of the first and second sections together. This process continues repeating until new complementary base pairs are formed for the entire section of DNA broken apart by a particular DNA helicase. As the DNA polymerase builds a new daughter strand out of complementary base pairs, it checks or proofreads the new strand, as do a number of other proofreading enzymes. Any errors that are found are corrected by the enzymes. This is important because, in part due to the speed at which replication occurs, 50 to 500 nucleotides per second, and in part due to the spontaneous flip-flops of bases owing to chemical causes, Initial errors in replication can number about one for every 10,000 base pairs. Fortunately, proofreading and correction by DNA polymerase and other enzymes reduces the final error rate to approximately one in every one to two billion pairs in mammals. The errors or mutations that occur in the replication of DNA can have significant impacts on individuals and on species. Mutations that occur within body cells can, for example, cause illnesses such as cancer if the mutation programs the cell and all its daughter cells to grow and divide uncontrollably. Such mutations are often caused in humans by radiation and chemicals such as those found in cigarette smoke that break strands of DNA. As we will see, the resulting repair work often leaves the DNA with an error. Mutations that occur in sex cells don't affect the individual in which they occur, but rather, if they are carried in a sex cell that unites with another sex cell, they are carried into the next generation. Such mutations have the potential not only to affect the individual that initially inherit them, but in the long term, the species as a whole. That is because an individual who inherits a mutation has a copy of that mutation in every cell of their body, 
including the ones they will eventually use in the production of sex cells. If the mutation increases the fitness, as judged by natural selection, of the individual and succeeding generations, the mutation will likely become more and more common in the species population. Each and every one of us are largely the result of mutations that, starting with the first piece of DNA in the first living organism, have been successful in increasing the fitness of individuals and species as judged by natural selection. We are, therefore, the products of successful mutations and the adaptations they led to. But history is full of even larger numbers of mutations that were judged by natural selection as unfit for survival. There are three basic types of mutations. Point mutations, insertions, and deletions. Occasionally, during replication, in spite of all the proofreading and corrections, a mismatched base pair in one of the chromosomes, as for instance, an adenine base pairing with a cytosine base, goes unnoticed, and the cell proceeds with either mitosis or meiosis. Repair enzymes in the daughter cell that received the mismatched pair notice the mismatch and proceed to correct it. However, these enzymes no longer have any way of knowing which strand is an original parental strand or a newly replicated daughter strand. If the enzymes correct the mismatch by replacing the base on the daughter strand, the original base pair will be restored. However, if the enzymes correct the mismatch by replacing the base on the original strand, a base pair different from the original DNA will result, and a point mutation will have occurred. Insertions and deletions occur not due to any errors in replication, but rather from a break or breaks in one of the strands. Often outside sources, such as radiation or chemicals, cause these breaks. Insertions often occur when one strand breaks in a single location and one or both of the freed ends loop out. Repair enzymes fill in the resulting gap with new nucleotides, making the strand that had the break longer than the strand that remained intact. As a result of how the process of replication works, after cellular division, one daughter cell will receive a new longer segment of DNA due to the insertion mutation while the other will receive an unchanged, mutation-free segment of DNA. Deletion mutations occur if a strand of DNA breaks in two places, the section between the breaks is forced out, and the repair enzymes draw the two remaining strands together without filling in the missing nucleotides. Again, a loop occurs in one of the strands, but in this case, it is the intact strand, now when cellular division occurs, one daughter will receive a shorter segment of DNA due to the deletion mutation while the other strand remains unchanged. Having seen how DNA replicates itself and how mutations occur, we now look at how the genetic information contained in an individual's DNA is converted to proteins that make living organisms what they are. We now look at how the information encoded on a gene-length piece of DNA is converted into a protein. DNA is made up of sequences of nucleotides, while proteins are made up of sequences of amino acids. It is then reasonable to hypothesize that the sequence of nucleotides on a given length section of DNA must somehow encode for the sequence of amino acids that produce a given protein. As we will see shortly, Scientists have determined exactly how the sequence of nucleotides in a gene are related to the sequence of amino acids in a protein. But another question immediately arises when we look at how proteins are manufactured from the instructions encoded on DNA. Proteins are manufactured in the cytoplasm of a cell, specifically in structures called ribosomes. However, DNA, being the cell's master molecular reference library, never leaves the protection of the nucleus except during mitosis or meiosis. Obviously, there has to be a molecular medium and mechanism by which the information on the DNA of a gene is copied or transcribed and then carried out to ribosomes that then take the information and translate it into a protein molecule. 
The molecular medium for the process of translating DNA into proteins is RNA. The mechanisms of the process are transcription and translation. RNA is similar to DNA, but differs in three respects. RNA is usually single-stranded. The sugar in the backbone of RNA is ribose instead of deoxyribose, and the thymine base of DNA is replaced by uracil in RNA. There are three types of RNA, messenger RNA, transfer RNA, and ribosomal RNA. All three have critical roles in the process of synthesizing proteins from information encoded in a gene. The process of synthesizing a protein begins with transcription. During transcription, the information contained in the DNA of a specific gene is transcribed into messenger, or mRNA for short, creating the copy of the code that will be read by the ribosomal and transfer RNA as they build a new protein. But what exactly is this code that biologists refer to as the genetic code, and what exactly is the relationship between nucleotides and amino acids? It isn't a one-to-one -one relationship, as each DNA and RNA are only made up of four different kinds of nucleotides, while proteins can be made up of up to 20 different amino acids. Two bases along a strand of DNA or RNA aren't enough either, as four bases times four bases yields only 16 combinations. However, three bases along a strand of DNA can yield four times four times four, or 64 possible combinations, more than enough to code for 20 amino acids. Experiments by James Crick, one of the discoverers of the structure of DNA in 1961, confirmed that the genetic code is in triplet. Three bases specify one amino acid. Fortunately, for our purposes, all four bases on the nucleotides of RNA and DNA start with different letters of the alphabet so that their first letter can be used as an abbreviation in models and on tables outlining the genetic code. As we mentioned earlier, there are differences between RNA and DNA, and one of them is that uracil replaces thymine in transcribed copies of mRNA. Since mRNA is read by the structures producing proteins rather than DNA directly, mRNA's alphabet of A, C, G, and U is used to illustrate the genetic code, rather than DNA's A, C, G, and T. Each series of three letters, or triplet, along a strand of mRNA is referred to as a codon. But how did geneticists determine which codon specified which amino acid? They synthesized artificial mRNA and added it to a protein synthesizing mixture they derived from bacteria. They would add a long strand of mRNA made up exclusively of, say, 3A codons to the protein synthesizing mixture and see what protein it produced. In this case, it produced a protein made up exclusively of the amino acid lysine. The researchers went through all 64 possible combinations of letters or codons from triple A to triple U, seeing which amino acid they coded for. Since there are 64 codons and only 20 amino acids, most amino acids are coded for by more than one codon. For example, the amino acid arginine is coded for by six codons, CGU, CGC, CGA, CGG, AGA, and AGG. Tryptophan and methionine are the only amino acids coded for by only one codon each, tryptophan by UGG and methionine by AUG. The AUG codon also has a special role. It signals the start or beginning of a protein. Thus, it is often called a start or initiator codon. There are three other codons that don't code for any protein, but just signal stop to the protein manufacturing ribosomes. The three stop codons are UAA, UAG, and UGA. There is no punctuation in the genetic code other than start and stop, 
Strands of mRNA can be thought of as very long sentences written exclusively in three-letter words. Understanding how the genetic code works, we can see how it is copied into mRNA and carried out to the cytoplasm, where rRNA and tRNA use it to build proteins. Though all the cells in an organism contain exactly the same DNA, different types of cells in a multicellular organism take on different forms and functions. What causes a blood cell to be different from, say, a nerve cell is that various factors cause them to transcribe different sections of the DNA in the nucleus into mRNA, thus causing the cells to produce different proteins and look and function differently. Any given cell in an organism thus only transcribes those genes relevant to its function in the organism. For example, stem cells in bone marrow that produce red blood cells constantly transcribe the genes necessary for the production of hemoglobin, which is critical in a red blood cell's role of carrying oxygen to and carbon dioxide away from other cells in the organism. On the other hand, muscle cells probably never transcribe those genes, but frequently transcribe the genes for actin and myosin proteins crucial to the contraction of muscles. Thus, in any given cell, transcription typically only copies the DNA of selected genes into RNA. During transcription, only one strand of DNA is transcribed into RNA. Although both sides of the DNA and a chromosome contain genes, the code for any given gene is usually totally on one strand or the other. The strand being transcribed into RNA is often referred to as the sense strand, as it is the one of the two strands that makes sense. The process of transcription is divided into three parts, initiation, elongation, and termination. Transcription, or as it is often referred to, RNA synthesis, begins with initiation. A promoter region lies just upstream from the beginning of each specific gene. RNA polymerase, the enzyme that carries out RNA transcription, recognizes the unique nucleotide sequence of the promoter region of the gene to be transcribed and attaches itself to the DNA there. After it attaches itself, the RNA polymerase starts forcing the strands of the DNA to open up and separate at the beginning of the gene. This starts the process of elongation. The RNA polymerase moves along the sense strand in the direction dictated by the orientation of the sugar phosphate molecules that form the backbone of the strand, just as DNA polymerase did in DNA replication. Using free RNA nucleotides in the nucleus, it builds a single complementary strand of RNA using the same base pairing rules as used in DNA replication, except that uracil, rather than thymine, is now paired with adenine. Unlike DNA replication, however, the base pairings are not permanent, but rather after 10 or so nucleotides have been added to the growing RNA strand, the beginning molecules begin to separate and form a tail that extends out from the DNA. The final step in transcription is termination, the RNA polymerase stops elongating the strands of RNA and releases it. The RNA polymerase then disappears and the strands of DNA rejoin to one another. The newly formed RNA will leave the nucleus through pores in the nuclear envelope. If it is mRNA, it will attach to a ribosome where its genetic code will be read and a protein synthesized. If it is rRNA, it will join with other rRNA strands and a variety of proteins to form a ribosome. If it is tRNA, it will bind to amino acids and carry them to a ribosome in order to create the string of amino acids that will form a protein. The process of reading the genetic code on an mRNA molecule and converting or translating it into a protein is fittingly enough called translation. Translation occurs in ribosomes that, as mentioned earlier, are made up of rRNA and proteins. Ribosomes consist of two parts, a small subunit and a large subunit. 
The small subunit is made up of one rRNA and about 30 proteins. The large subunit consists of three rRNA and 45 to 50 proteins. The large subunit also contains an enzymatic region that catalyzes the addition of amino acids to growing protein chains and two sites, usually referred to as P and A, that temporarily attach to tRNA during translation. Translation, like transcription, occurs in three stages, initiation, protein elongation, and termination. Initiation begins when two codons of mRNA and several protein initiation factors bind to a small ribosome subunit. The first codon is always the AUG, or start codon. In this example, the second codon is AGU, a tRNA with the appropriate amino acid bound to it will attach to each of these codons. There are many different kinds of tRNA, at least one for every amino acid, but all have a shape somewhat like a three-leaf clover. Amino acids are bound to the stem of tRNA by enzymes that recognize each specific tRNA and attach the correct amino acid to their stem. The top of the central leaf of each tRNA has three exposed bases that form a structure called an anticodon. The anticodon of each tRNA is complementary to the codon of the mRNA that specifies the amino acid attached to that tRNA. AUG specifies the amino acid methionine and its complementary or anticodon is UAC. So a tRNA carrying methionine and the anticodon UAC form hydrogen bonds with the start or AUG codon. After that occurs, the large subunit attaches to the small subunit, and simultaneously, the tRNA attaches to the P site on the large subunit. Now that the ribosome is completely assembled, it is ready to begin the process of protein elongation. A tRNA with the anticodon UCA, the complementary codon for AGU, now moves into site A, which is adjacent to site P on the large subunit. The catalytic region below and between sites A and P on the large subunit break the bond between the starter amino acid, methionine, and its tRNA and uses the released energy to join the methionine to the serine carried by the second tRNA. The now empty start tRNA drops off of its site P and the ribosome shifts one codon to the right on the mRNA, shifting the second tRNA with two amino acids now attached to it into site P. A new tRNA with an appropriate anticodon and amino acid now moves into site A. The catalytic region breaks the bond holding the two amino acids to their tRNA and joins them to the new amino acid in this case, glycine, in site A. The empty tRNA in site P drops off, and the ribosome again shifts one codon to the right. The process repeats like this until a long protein chain is formed. Termination occurs when near the end of the mRNA, a stop codon, UAA, UAG, or UGA, is reached. No tRNA bonds to the stop codon, Rather, termination factors cut the completed protein from the last tRNA, releasing it from the ribosome. The long protein chains, built through the process of elongation, then fold into their characteristic shape. Some of these proteins immediately go to work in the cell, carrying out structural roles or catalyzing chemical reactions. Other proteins, such as various digestive enzymes, remain inactive until they are released outside the cell, where factors in the external environment turn on their active sites and make them fully operational. The proteins created as a result of the processes of transcription and translation, in large part, define the characteristics of every living organism, including we humans. 
the conversion of this information stored on strands of DNA into the structural and catalytic proteins that form the essence of all living organisms populating the Earth is the most fundamental and important process in the living world. By understanding and being able to manipulate the process by which information stored on long molecules of DNA is converted into living, breathing organisms, we are entering an era in which we will see unprecedented advances in biotechnology, medicine, agriculture, and other areas of human endeavor. However, this new understanding will also ask us to make important ethical and moral judgments about how far we as humankind should go in altering and or perhaps even creating life. The future of all life on Earth will depend on how human society answers these important questions about turning molecules into life.